Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley. I do not get that accent at all. Oh, that was, yeah, that was a bad <laughs> Hitchcock. It was more Sean Connery. <laughs> that sounded like your Green Knight, the Green Knight <laughs> no, accent. No, that was <laughs> deliberately mispronounced and just blowing the spelling out. That was Warshler. I can't tell the difference. Yeah. Today we are reviewing a movie from 1960, Psycho. And I have to admit, Wes, that I haven't been as intimidated to approach a movie since, um, like, Jaws. We're moving our bracket back. This is our oldest movie being discussed. Oh, right. Predates Night of the Living Dead, also part of our Halloween series. Uh, So our oldest movie to date, obviously a classic, is Psycho original material. It was based on a book called Psycho, and Alfred Hitchcock found that Paramount, the studio with whom he had a contract, hadn't covered the book for adaptation. And so he just went and sought out this book that was on a bestseller list or something, read it, optioned it under a pseudonym, and then tried to suppress as many copies of the book by buying it up as possible to avoid spoiling the ending. And from that point on, Psycho was all about a movie, I mean, with some notable changes. Can you speak to those changes? For one thing, Marion Crane gets beheaded in the shower instead of just stabbed. Ew. Hitchcock had enough of a tough time filming this stuff. I mean, this was sensational stuff. And even the toned down version, there's no way you could have matched the print of a novel. Was it sensational for Janet Lee to spend a good amount of time just in her bra? It seems tame by comparison. I mean, she was only on set for three weeks. I'm guessing that the hotel scene for the liaison was a big part of that. And yeah, she's in her bra and then obviously the shower scene. But that still felt kind of salacious, didn't it? So you're saying that even though it's very tame by today's standards, there's still a real intimacy to that intimate scene between Marion and Sam at the top her packing in her bra, kind of egregious, and then the shower scene where we don't see anything, but it's still very intimate. Is that what you're talking about? A little bit. I mean, I think that even for the time, you expect a certain, oh, it's a black and white movie and it's older. Even though most movies were in color by then, this was a choice, a lot like Night of the Living Dead almost 10 years later. But it seems like for these movies, you expect a certain level of morality. You know, it's the first movie with a toilet flushing and there's some things you can't show. That's just improper. And it seemed like to start off in such a way, you you would expect that their actions would reflect later on the characters. Sam is a married man, right? I don't think he is he's he has an ex-wife to whom he's paying alimony oh, right. and he can't afford to give a proper life to a new wife to marion if that's indeed his true reason for not wanting to marry her and marion is you know this is only the beginning of her indiscretions but i expected that it would affect the perception of the characters moving forward the way that they were established because of marion's choices she got what she deserved It's interesting because Kelly and I were watching this and paying close attention, and she sits down at the desk in her hotel room uh, just pre-shower and writes down the figures, which obviously the detective would later come to find out, oh, this establishes Marion Crane was in fact here. The sister found the shreds in the bathroom. You know, she says, this proves that Marion was here, or maybe Sam says it. But I was like, why does she need to write out the total? She knows in her head that it was 40000 minus 700 for the car. And then I learned, according to Joe Stefano, the screenwriter, that she was writing out the figures in her head to see how much she had to recoup, because at that point, Marion had decided she was going to return the money. Right. Had you, did this occur to you? Like, what tipped you off to that fact? Um, well, she, her creating that ledger happened after she had the conversation with Norman Bates. And she says in, in that conversation at the end that she's going back to Phoenix, that she needs to get rest to prepare for the long ride back to Phoenix. Oh, I thought she was like keeping him at arm's length the whole time. No, I think that 
you know, as crazy as Norman Bates is, they actually speak some truth to one another. And within that conversation, she turns, she decides she's going to return. And maybe that was necessary to continue driving the plot forward. Maybe that was also orchestrated so that we could have some sympathy for the Marion character, who is otherwise kind of reckless. You know, the fact that she decides that she's not going to commit embezzlement, you know, probably gives us some sympathy when she gets murdered in the shower. Man, look at you, Iris Arbogast. <laughs> you know, that conversation was very telling and it was and it was long. You know, they chit chat and they get deep and he goes crazy and then he comes back to his senses. Like, it's a very, um, what's the word when it's like detailed, attenuated? It's a very... Uh, Mental note, look up attenuated. Admittedly, I didn't follow the conversation all that closely. I was distracted by the taxidermy. Right, which I think is intentional too. Yes. I mean, super creepy and also kind of sets him up for preserving and keeping around a stuffed version of his mom. I mean, the mom's skull is a skeleton, but presumably the rest of that body is stuffed with sawdust, right? Well, we did hear that he preserved her and treated her body as best he could. You know, I was also thinking about the ledger thing because obviously it's very easy to do the math. You can do the $40,000 minus 700 in your head, right? What's that? come out to <laughs> 36 the wait 40,000 39,300 dollars <laughs> but then, and then in Joe Stefano's mind the screenwriter the shower was her cleansing herself of said sins mm. she was all happy mm. and and this was her turning point and she was redeemed if only in her mm. head that's very interesting that the shower is like the demarcation line of her turn and this is the deconstruction of psycho i think for us this movie comes with all kinds of expectations and pressure and history i mean the history and the buzz. This was an old movie by the time that either of us were born. But it's so much to unpack in a modern context. What do you mean? At no point in our lives did we not know that Marion Crane was going to step into that shower and get murdered. Yeah, I can see why Hitchcock would try and preserve the surprise because when you know that the threat of the mother is inert without the threat of Norman Bates, right. like when you know that there isn't a mom, it really takes the air out of a lot of the film. Like when Lila goes to the house and you obviously know that Norman Bates is with Sam, seeing that and not knowing that the mother character is is not real there would be so much suspense with Lila going to the house. You'd be like, ah, you cringing, like every tur every corner she turns. When she goes down to the basement, like it would be super, super freaky. But there's no way to watch this movie without knowing that the mother is Norman Bates. And that's what I love about this movie. I love the history of it. Alfred Hitchcock was as much a part of the psycho experience as his film was. He was the consummate showman in that he very much wanted a pure movie-going experience so that they had all these screenings and he begged people personally, do not talk about the delicious little secrets of Psycho after you see it. And telling every single theater owner, you are not to admit anyone to this movie after the showtime because this movie is running around the clock upon release. And I guess at that time, it was common, fairly commonplace for people to stroll in, sit down mid-movie. And then to get the threads, they would just watch it through. And then when it resets, they would just watch the beginning part of the movie. It's like, we're not going to be mm. beholden to theater times, which is unbelievable to me, which is incredible to me. <laughs> And so counterintuitive to you and this whole idea of a pure movie going experience, it is akin today to people saying this movie deserves to be seen on the biggest screen possible. See this movie, huh. don't watch it on your phone, which so many people are casual moviegoers. And believe me, I'm a casual movie watcher when it comes to movies I've seen a thousand times. I'll watch them doing dishes and no matter what I'm doing. But for Psycho, it was important that all these secrets be preserved. And so when that can't happen for us, because we've always known that Norman Bates is the mother character and that Janet Lee gets killed in the shower, then we look for the other stuff. We do our own little Arbogast things and try to see the little nuances. And I wonder, couldn't help wondering, do you think Psycho ruined taxidermy? <laughs> Before that, it's a time-honored tradition, right? And it's been around forever, but... Like, did it make it creepy? Um, Is it like people can't taxiderm just like later on people can't be party clowns anymore? Can't, that was the exact analogy I was going to draw. You can't be a clown. You can't be a taxidermist. People definitely want, I mean, I still think it's creepy, not just the act of taxidermy, but the idea of having a deer's head on your wall. But people are awfully proud. And if you're willing to shoot it in the neck, maybe you're willing to have its head mounted over your fireplace. So have you heard about this new trend of like, um, 
I forget what it is, but you can like capture the essence of a, of a loved one. The essence? Look, if the charlatans want to come at you and be like, I can withdraw the essence and I can infuse it into this plant, then sure, you go and do your thing. <laughs> Whatever makes people feel better. I know that you can, you can compress your loved ones into a gem like carbonized in junk. I know that you can swirl them into glass. I've seen that at fairs. And I know that you can plant them in a tree pod. There was a person who taxidermies people. What? It was on some show and it's called Extreme Embalming. Oh man, that's a show. I mean, in a world where we have Dr. Pimple Popper, the fact that this <laughs> show exists doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, have you heard what they do to treat bodies for a public funeral, for a viewing? So they're kind of embalmed, right? And then they are all, and then they're made up. Yes, but all the tricks, like you know, they don't even replace organs after an autopsy. There's contact lenses with little spikies, so that when you pull the eyelids back down, they don't pop up again. Ew! Like all the dude, I'm telling you, every orifice is sewn shut from the inside, so you can't see. It's barbaric. So you people who want to feel better about yourselves, because funerals is all about the people remaining, right? The dead people don't care. Exactly. You, you yeah. have to know what you're going into. And under the surface, it's just a mess. How do you know this? I remember being at a funeral. I think it was Pearl, the lady, the old lady that we grew up next to uh, in Hawthorne. And she had passed away and I was at her funeral. And dad walked up to me and she, <laughs> the casket is open at the top, right? So I'm looking at her face and looking down her body, which is covered, and I'm looking and it's covered and she's never going to be uncovered again. And I'm like, she's probably not even wearing shoes. Like, why would you have put shoes on her? And in my memory, dad was like, she probably doesn't even have feet. And that messed with me and created a logical progression in my mind where nothing that is shown has to be real. Like, there's no telling what's happening behind the scenes. Those clothes aren't real clothes. They're like open in the back like hospital gowns and just need to be draped a certain way. It's all artifice and it's creepy. Well, it's creepy because of the context, but I mean, isn't that all movie magic? Yeah, movie magic, absolutely. <laughs> but the people... <laughs> <laughs> who would stuff their loved ones like if that person he's in it to make a living right but anybody who has anybody that they know and love stuffed is into some shady stuff right is not <laughs> altogether well <laughs> well they're not accepting some truth about life which is that all people die i mean maybe if you want some nice hands like a hand sculpture or something <laughs> Ew, Look, that because, would be okay with you? Right, but if you have a deer head mounted to your wall, a stag, a, an 18-point buck or whatever the hell, then it's acceptable for its head to be emerging from this crest. But I think if you're going to taxidermy humans, it's got to be 100%, right? Like in a naturalistic pose and some Levi's. <laughs> you can't have just part of the human. That's that's morbid. Uh, I mean, what are your final wishes? You don't want to be preserved in any way? It's 100% cremated and throw me off the north end of Happy Isles Bridge. Aww. Kelly's got these instructions. It's fine. Oh, okay. All right. Right. So you already have your plan in place. Dad probably had some insight, you know, when he was talking about that chick's feet. Because he, like, worked in a morgue and stuff. Do you remember that? Nope. Like where the bodies would just exhale gas and sit up randomly and make <laughs> horrible moaning sounds? Thought... You don't remember this? I do remember him saying this, and I remember him demonstrating it and making the noise, <laughs> but I thought he Googled it, which obviously isn't something that could have happened. I, <laughs> that's that's so crazy. But do you think Psycho inspired this extreme embalming scenario? Norman Bates has his issues. Of course. Uh, and would probably have been an extreme embalmer had he the technology yep. to have done so. But he's got to be on his toes. I mean, they move the highway away, so he rarely has an opportunity to murder, and I think he flexes it whenever he can. It's not like this is a revelation. Look, you discovered my secret, and you have to die. He fully intends to kill people. Uh... Marion didn't do anything to him. Marion wasn't on to him. On to him? What do you mean on to him? Well, she didn't go to her death thinking that guy was just a little bit too weird. I'm definitely going to call the authorities tomorrow. No, she didn't. But her crime was being beautiful and probably kind. Like she might have stolen Norman away from his mother? Exactly. That's so twisted. <laughs> that activated the mother side of his psyche. And the mother side was jealous because Norman 
conversely was jealous of his mother with her new beau. Yeah, so mother mother took over and mother murdered Marion for having tempted her son. Man, good one. Last scene psychiatrist tacked on to the end of this movie. You know, he is very tacked on. Dr. Fred Richmond gets quite the hefty monologue for for only appearing in the last five, ten minutes yeah. of the film. Universally reviled. Widely considered really? uh, Hitchcock's worst scene ever filmed. Uh, apparently this was tacked on because of studio pressure for the dum-dums or the non-payer attentioners to get some uh, some exposition. And it completely derails everything. We're in this police station setting and the movie is done. And it doesn't need the explanation. And he's just a little bit ham-handed. I could definitely see that it was an afterthought because it doesn't feel like it's a scene that's crafted 360. Like Lila, Marion's sister, is sitting there like, tell me more, doctor. Like, you just found out that your sister is dead, but she was murdered by a psychopath. And she's like, hmm, interesting. Is it implicitly understood by all viewers or is it understood by all modern viewers because we've seen Psycho? I could totally see if this were made today, this would be like the surprise appearance of, you know, it's starring Kevin Spacey as Dr. So-and-so. And then immediately after the the monologue exposition scene, we'd find out that Kevin Spacey was actually really the murderer. <laughs> right. And that he, he <laughs> carefully orchestrated this poor dude in the next room. <laughs> exactly. He was the puppet master. I mean, Psycho wasn't meant to be the one. It was, it's not wasn't meant to define Hitchcock's career. He made his way bigger and badder and more expensive movies. And then he was like, you know, those schlocky B movies, I'm going to make one of those in black and white and it's going to be under a million dollars and this is the one that came more or less came to define his legacy and so when it was done in in color people questioned first of all why it would be made and said that the color and the updated the adaptation kind of took a lot of uh the effect out of it the psycho remake is a B movie only in that it holds the unique distinction of being only one of a few movies where prominent b-hole is shown on screen wait what so Anne Heche <laughs> this is like internet trivia coming back to me uh, and when Anne Heche is stabbed pulls the shower curtain down and keels over on screen you get a glimpse of her b-hole and there are very few wow. major Hollywood movies that show b-hole and this is one of them and that's my b-movie joke for the psycho shot for shot remake you're welcome wow maybe it was stunt b-hole <laughs> Well, uh, Janet Lee, the legend has it, it was stunt body, the body double. So you said that Psycho wasn't intended to define Alfred Hitchcock's body of work, but did it define Anthony Perkins and did it define composer Bernard Herrmann? That is a name that you should know because that dude was just a random dude and Hitchcock, he was going to play the shower scene quiet except for the stabbing noises, which would be really unsettling. Bernard Herrmann took it upon himself to score the scene anyway. And when Hitchcock was all miserable about how his he was going to cut this movie down and make it into an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Why? Because he didn't like the way it turned out. And then Bernard Herrmann came in and scored it. And he was to, he said he totally energized and vitalized the movie. Hitchcock doubled his salary when he found how much the music contributed to his cut of the movie. He was very proud of it and went around for the rest of his life saying that Bernard Herrmann and Psycho's score, the music of Psycho, is 33% of its effectiveness. A statistic based on who knows what. Anthony Perkins, to answer your question, his second movie he was nominated for an Academy Award. Do you know what that role is? No. Me neither, because he was only ever in the Psychos. He went through four of them and was forever typecast. And then Janet Lee was a major movie star, one of the largest movie stars in the world. She was the Sam Jackson of the Deep Blue Sea in this one. And so the effectiveness of him, her getting murdered after we followed her story and sympathized with her was shocking. Janet Lee was inspired casting despite being a, a major star. And the score, I mean, I can't, I can't say how big the score was of the experience of rewatching this. Like the title sequence is mesmerizing. Super simple, but also like super modern. Like if you redid that title sequence for for a thriller today, I think it would still be really effective and gripping. And that combined with the music, like that score is genius. Yep. And not just the eh, 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 that we're all used to from the shower. What was it? But like what that... was it? I don't remember. Do it again. <laughs> eh, 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 That's like a totally different octave for you. Are you doing the stabby motions? 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> the ma- the main theme of the score and how it moves. It feels like a journey. It feels like a thriller. It feels scary. It feels big. Iconic movie score always near the top of the list of all-time movie scores. The title sequence is interesting that you bring up. Uh, did you notice that they front-loaded that whole thing and there is zero end credits? Oh. The movie just ends. They haul the car up and it's like, the end. And then the movie stops. Yeah, you're right. They did front load all the credits. And I thought that Janet Lee was, her with Janet Lee billing was interesting. Did you also notice at the end, and it could have been my mind playing tricks on me watching this late at night, but did you notice at the end, they crossfade Norman Bates's face with another version of his face before we cut to the car? Yeah, it's three faces. It's Norman Bates and his mother and the skeleton. <gasps> And so you can get a glimpse of the teeth. There's That image has been analyzed as well. Hitchcock, that was a last-minute addition, apparently. Hitchcock was just, he'd sent out a number of cuts. There was just Norman's face, and then there was the more overt skeleton face, and this was a blending of the three of them. Yes, I noticed it. And it was mostly, mostly in the teeth. I, I noticed the teeth, and I was really affected by it. And I watched it a couple times, and I was like, that is creepy. Yeah. Does Anthony Perkins look like Lance Fisher? Uh, a little bit, but he was 40-ish and homely and bald and short and stocky in the book. And they were like, yeah, no, we actually, it will be more, he's obviously a killer, right? Can't have the Danny DeVito type when it looks like the penguin, he's going to kill people. So they got the young, good looking, uh, Hitchcock said that he evokes a young Jimmy Stewart and even Kelly, who will be annoyed that I included this in the edit was like, is it weird that like before he started murdering people, he was kind of cute, like kind of charming. And that was, well, isn't that... <laughs> and that's the point. Isn't that the point, right? That he's wholesome, sweet, thoughtful. But also it's not like people didn't know this movie wasn't titled the little hotel just off the highway. <laughs> It was called Psycho. There was only like two people at the beginning of this movie. Someone's going to die. Someone's going to kill that other person. And so I looked for what worked behind the scene, the real, um, the things that still hold this movie together. And I've decided that Arbogast is a really good detective. His insistence, his persistence, and the way he corner his footwork and the way he corners Norman Bates is really yeah. cool to watch. How he catches him in the little lies and reiterates them and all that stuff. Are you talking about the main conversation when they're talking over the uh, the guest book? Yes. The ledger? And how he catches him in, in asking him to repeat stuff. Arbogast was the most affecting part of this movie for me because when he goes upstairs, even though I knew the mother didn't exist and that Norman was the killer, etc., when she lurches out of the hallway and stabs him, I jumped. And the score really? hit me just at the right moment. And I knew it was coming because I knew he does that strange flying down the staircase in slow motion thing. That didn't work so much for me. That moment where she comes at him with the knife, I jumped in spite of myself. 60 years later, wow. I jumped. Norman, when Norman reacts to Marion's faux pas about putting her away or something, the mother away, um, yeah. his response suggests that he knows what it means to be inside of an institution. Mm. He talks about you've never been in one of those places. Do you know what it's like to be in there? Right. Very telling. The sheriff, who's also great, he never really suggests that Norman was ever institutionalized or really that crazy for that matter. No. So Norman was pretty pretty high functioning psychopath. But there was some history there too. I mean, but there was some legend there when he talks about how the mother poisoned the husband and took a dose herself and then it's later revealed that in fact Norman poisoned both of them intentionally and then yeah. acted out his mother the loss of his mother compensated by acting out yeah I don't know I don't know how much weight we want to give to the, the psychiatrist um, we give Hitchcock a lot of credit for this film and there's a lot of credit due but it really sounds like Hitchcock was surrounded by some pretty talented filmmakers yeah there's a lot about it and and the whole movie going experience this is the stuff i love this is the cultural phenomenon stuff that people were affected and standing in lines and it's a big secret and you got to see it and it was you know you got to pay attention and don't spoil it it was a big deal and hitchcock was involved and he was the the anti disney like Hitchcock at one point wanted to film on the Disney Studios lot and Walt Disney refused cuz he made that horrible movie Psycho oh but I mean, this was his baby and he was all excited about it. And 
this is why people need to watch movies from start to finish and have to have some reverence. We talked about the <laughs> talked about the corpses. This is movies are all artifice, and you have to experience them facing a certain direction with a certain level of immersion, or they don't work. I don't know. You have to kind of get invested in the things you can because the other surprises of this movie have been taken away from me. And I'm fascinated always by some little nothing movie that nobody expects to go anywhere. Paramount, which is the studio, even though it was filmed at Universal, hated it. And they were like, this movie's not going to go anywhere. But Hitchcock wants to do this thing, so we're going to let him do it. And he deferred his quarter million dollar salary in exchange for 60% of the box office receipts. Good idea. Which then they thought wasn't going to total 250 grand. Modern equivalent of what Alfred Hitchcock ultimately took home from the box office, something like $125 million. Whoa. And modern equivalent of $40,000? Uh, it's about 381000 something like that. So enough to do a thing, but not enough to get killed over. That's still a lot of money. Not that Norman benefited from it or whatever. 368922 I was close. Um, but it's difficult to rate a movie this far back. You have to experience it and hopefully do a little research because you have to understand its place in cinema. I would guess that for a typical TikTok teenager, Psycho wouldn't hold a tremendous amount of appeal. Is this movie good on its own merits? Absolutely. I don't know, the psychiatrist scene was kind of crap. And I think the way that Norman ultimately got taken down after a pretty successful run was kind of anticlimactic, but whatever. I'll go ahead and give Psycho a totally with an asterisk that you got to do your own research, got to do your own digging and understand why it's a totally. It's a legacy totally. So you can't just like watch it and be like, that was cool. You got to understand its historical context and cultural significance. I mean, scarily enough, you could tell some teenager, dude, Janet Lee, that's Jamie Lee Curtis's mom. And they'll be like, who's Jamie Lee Curtis? <laughs> There you got it. That's a totally from Wes, a good, obviously, although now I'm stating it for the first time, from Iris on 1960s Alfred Hitchcock's Universal's Paramount Psycho. I hope you're enjoying our Halloween series, including in no particular order, Psycho, The Babadook, <laughs> Night of the Living Dead. Did I say it wrong? Babadook? <laughs> You have offended the, the honor of this beautiful woman, said the duck. The Baba Duck. The Baba Duck. <laughs> uh, you can see, check out our other creepy <laughs> reviews, like It Follows, Relic, at orwhatevermovies.com, <laughs> or wherever you get podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at orwhatevermovies. Thanks for listening, and <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>